first of all, a reminder for me to let everybody know that this meeting is being recorded. So if you don't want your face to appear, please uh, switch off your camera. Um, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Bruce Grieve, who's the NA Chair of uh, AgriSensors and Electronics at uh, the University of Manchester. Bruce has had quite a wide and varied career, I think it's fair to say, doing about 20 years in industry before joining Manchester um, and having set up his own spin-out company for Tenix. Um, he's a well-known figure on uh, the UK phenotyping um, scene and has been a great help to the Advanced Plant Growth Centre in sort of bringing us in and introducing us to those people and, and helping us uh, try and develop what it is that we're trying to develop. Um, so without further ado, I will hand over to Bruce and uh, let him present his talk. All yours, Bruce. Cheers, Rob. Um, yeah, it's probably worth just uh, saying where I'm coming from with all this as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm an, actually an electronic engineer, so I'm a bit of a fish out of water with, uh, when it comes down to the, the plant science world. Uh, so I, I worked in, um, uh, in Syngenta and all its various precursor companies for about 20 years, as Rob said. Uh, very much looking at online measurement and, um, you know, what went down the pipelines when they're producing chemistries and uh, what was going up the, the stacks and all this sort of stuff. Um, and then in about, uh, two, you know, to say, set in context here. So in about 2005, um, I then joined the business development unit, basically saying, what could uh, a company like Syngenta, looking at crop protection chemistries and seed genetics, what could they actually do with the uh, enabling technologies that were coming along at the time? Uh, and, and there's a whole load of those sorts of things, uh, which uh, are actually looking back at back at the uh, the history now as to what was being uh, considered. But um, one that was, and it's right, and obviously it had a lot of foresight, was around what we can do with information, information and sensing. So basically, um, dynamic measurements. You know, so we're, we're monitoring what's happening in reality as opposed to um, uh, just hit, taking notes on things like that. At the time, there was a lot of work being done on. Uh, remote satellite imaging, especially looking at things like, um, well, the classic stuff of leaf area index and the amount of biological material that um, was across the globe. So, um, so from that, we, we then started looking at um, how we could uh, actually introduce these sorts of electronics, um, low cost sensing approaches within a biotech business. And that involved a, a lot of interesting conversations with companies like uh, GSK, with Rolls-Royce, um, uh, with Philips Electronics at the time. Uh, and then what, what we did, we actually started um, looking at uh, what we call an open innovation model. Uh, and so Rolls-Royce had done a lot of this with, um, with various universities across, uh, across the globe, actually. Um, so basically domiciling people within a university environment uh, with capabilities which were um, outside what the company was doing at the moment and uh, but areas that they wanted to grow. So hence I was given the opportunity to set one up at Manchester. Uh, we, so we started at Manchester because it had some, um, almost because it didn't do crop science. Um, it was good on a, a broad sweep of, um, of engineering capabilities um, and around the physical sciences. Um, but the crop science part would actually come from partnering with others. So, bring on getting to the the, the, uh, the sort of slides and all that sort of stuff. So, wh where we came from is basically saying, how could we actually produce um, very low cost approaches and get multiplied? It, it, this is sort of predated the Internet of Things type uh, type concepts, but we were coming down that line anyway. Um, how could we actually produce massive amounts of data at very low cost? and then start acting on it. So we, we looked at how we could fundamentally re-engineer um, sensor systems um, to, to meet the duties. So basically almost like taking a black box approach, you know, asking uh, the, the crop science and phenotyping world um, how they did, well, why they were doing certain measurements at the moment, how they did them, and then saying, well, you know, are there better ways of doing this? So I'll, I'll give a few examples as we go through. Um, so, it, it's it's all been about um, partnering um, very much. I mean, that's why I've been talking to Rob and the APGC um, about what we can do with with, with you guys, um, because the the engineering bit, you know, in so, some ways, the um, the partnering bits, we, we effectively act like a systems integrator. So you you'll sort of cherry pick. I very much work on the principle of you know take technology that exists, cherry pick them. 
and bolt them together in a different way to do a different type of job. So, so there you might be dealing with material scientists, you might be dealing with um, computer scientists, biologists, all the, all the rest of it. Uh, in terms of the types of ele elemental technologies you might be bringing into here, and I'll, say, I'll give you some examples later on. But the other thing that we found out was that, um, and I always, <laughs> I've always got to think of a better phrase than this, but um, it, it's all very well to bring in a technology uh, that, that could monitor something uh, and, and, and tell you lots of different things about it. But you also need to know the effect of that. So it, it's, it's, you know, you can build the bomb, but it, uh, the effect of dropping it is not known until you actually do it. Um, so it's not a good, good, uh, good example, but um, it's basically working with the people like the business school, um, working with the, um, uh, the Global Development Institute for, for developing economies, actually say, well, if you do this, what's the effect on the outside world? So there's the obvious things with the developed world where you start saying, what's the value capture? How can you make a business out of it? Um, and then the developing world, you know, if you do this, um, how, does that take somebody else's job away? You know, it's a, the, the, there's a fine balance always, you know, when you bring in something that's not been there before. Uh, and so, so we, it's all been around linking in with the various groups, of, mostly across the UK, with the agri-tech centres, with um, uh, all the various phenotyping centres, uh, but also looking more and more globally these days as well. And so where I, where I come is basically looking at, uh, say, the, um, the Centre for Engineering, but um, that's only part of the picture, of course. Uh, I very much uh, look on the pre premise of, uh, you know, we, we effectively give the eyes and the ears of the system. The brain is, is the machine learning. So we, we do aspects of that to interpret things in different ways. But there's also what you do with it, whether it's a robotic system, whether it's actually um, uh, a web-based sort of system. You're actually doing something with that data, turning it actually into information and then onto knowledge. And of course, we, we I, I tend to sit with our team. Uh, we have a small team, which we call eAgri, uh, over in Manchester. Uh, and we, we dovetail um, with, uh, basically, it's a primary agriculture area is what we deal with. So it's everything to do with the biotic stresses, the abiotic stresses, you know, the diseases and the uh, uh, droughting, uh, salinity in soils, all these sorts of things. Um, and then looking at uh, crop traits as well, whether it's an output trait or an input trait. But that information that we get literally in the field a lot of the times, um, then is valuable further down the supply chain. If you know that you've got um, a certain water content in a tomato, uh, you know, tomato production or a sugar content, then you can use that for how you process it further down the, down the line. You know, looking at, um, you know, if, you, if you're doing something like um, a tomato ketchup line, then knowing the, that right in the field that you can actually produce to a certain level of, uh, of water content or sugar content affects the downstream process. And you could feed that information forward to use classic control terms. So it's, it's, it's trying to think beyond just the farm gate, uh, so to use the term. Um, so so where, where does this come from? There's a, there's a small university in the, uh, in the US, Harvard, put a report together, um, getting on for about 10 years ago now, and they started looking at the, the agri world and how things were changing. So they, they started with product, you know, tractor, classic one. Um, they then said, well, actually what's happening is now the, you get a smart product, you've got, uh, you're tracked with all its various um, uh, internal sort of control systems on it. And then of course, what then happens is it gets to be a smart connected product. You, all your tractors talk to every other tractor, you get your, uh, your systems auto steering and coordinating with each other. Uh, and then you have your unit actually talking to all its peripherals, your planters, combine, combine harvesters. But what then happens in the business world is that you start getting companies forming around that. And that's very much where, where we're sitting here, because in a lot of the sort of um, sensors data science world, these things don't exist yet. And it's a, you, you get this situation with, um, certainly with engineers, where they say, well, why would I want to go into crop science? There's not a career in there. And then you say, well, there is a career in there. You've just got to create it in the first place. Uh, and it, it sounds a bit of an odd way of putting it, but um, we're now seeing companies, non-traditional players in here. You, have, you, you had your traditionals, you know, you got your Syngentas, Bias, BSF on the, uh, on the chemistry end of things. You've got your John Deere's and your Trimbles and all these people like this doing 
doing the um, plant machinery. Um, but we're now getting non-traditional pay- players coming in because the funding's coming in, lots of startup happen, and then the big players start coming in. And that's what we're now starting to see is that uh, your Sony's, your Google's, all these sort of people, um, they're getting seriously interested in crops, in crops and crop production. Um, because they can make money out of it for a start. But, you know, the, the, the social good as well with the SDGs. Uh, and again, there's examples of that as we come through. So why, why is it happening? So we've got the obvious things um, that, that we keep hearing about in the news. So climate change, labour costs, uh, just-in-time supply, you know, resilient supplies. Uh, and fickle customers are put there. But uh, I mean, more you're looking at there, you know, changing dietary needs, um, the, the move away uh, from uh, high protein meat based diet, so, you know, tendencies now more into um, vegetarian and vegan sort of based diets. Um, then on top of that, of course, we quite um, beneficially, we've got, of course, the tech enablers. Uh, and so I would sit there saying, you know, the consumer electronics, the connectivity we have, you know, the classic ones, you your mobile phone type technology, um, machine learning, all your sort of 24 seven capability that's offered by robotics now. A, a tractor in a field doesn't need a driver on there. Most of the, uh, the machinery in, in, in the cab is the MP3 player for the driver to go and listen to stuff because he's bored. Um, so robots don't have to operate on a, on a shift. You know, they, they, they don't have an eight hour day or a seven hour day or whatever. They'll run 24 seven. And that gives you some interesting uh, insights in what you can do in the future, because of course you can run through the night, you can actually take advantage of the way that crops respond to the night environment as much as the day environment, uh, and the way that you apply chemistries or or, um, or inputs to, to crops. And it's, it changes the dynamic here. Um, and of course you can make money out of this stuff uh, if it's cheap and reliable. Uh, so the impact that we're starting to see, uh, and Rob meant at the start about uh, the phenotyping end of things. So we're starting to now see the move away from proxy measures in a laboratory environment, especially the laborious uh, proxy measures for, for looking at phenotypes, moving into more the semi-controlled and totally controlled, sorry, totally controlled environments, of course, with um, controlled environment farming, glasshouse production and screenhouses, but more and more so um, into the field actually putting these, uh, these measurements directly onto a, uh, onto a toolbar or a tractor or onto a robotic unit going through a field. Because once your, your crops are going out there, um, they're in a big laboratory themselves. Uh, though, though you don't have a total control over that laboratory, the weather will always be in, in, in charge and, um, and what are the other inputs that you cannot actually control. Um, the, the fact that you can actually do controlled perturbations on that system or understand a a perturbations happen to it, then you can now still have a lot of data coming in from the field, which then can get fed back into your um, into how you design your genetics in the future to really survive in the outside world. Um, the term digital twins, um, again, it's difficult to do this. Uh, so seminars online at like this, you can't say who's ever heard of a digital twin. Um, but this this concept of being able to actually get real time sensing and imaging type data into a model and the, the model then actually can continually manipulate itself to then actually rebalance to reality. Um, it's now referred to as a digital twin, but there's been lots of precursors to that. Um, there's, there's one area that um, also we're starting to see, it's, um, and, and I'll say we'll touch on some examples later, where we are seeing this ability for the developing economies to leapfrog um, in the way that, sort of, you know, of course, in the past, things like the Green Revolution, as well as the Silicon Revolution. Um, now, what we're seeing is that the if you get these technologies down to a low enough cost um, and in a robust enough form, they don't have to be the best technologies, but they have to be ubiquitous. Um, then the developing economies, there's a lot of very intelligent people out there that just haven't got a lot of money. Um, and they can uptake this technology and shift forward in the way that they maybe couldn't have done with um, standard mechanized farming, whereby you might not be able to afford 150, 200,000 uh, euros for a, um, for a, for a Matthew Ferguson or a, or a John Deere to sit on your, your tractor in, uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, but you can, you can afford a lot of um, uh, mobile phone-based type sensing, uh, and that's already happening, 
And if you go more to where the world's going now with the Internet of Things, even more chance of doing this. So it's, there's a chance for the develop, developing world to accelerate itself. Um, and then we start to see also the um, uh, the agriculture industry following the the line of um, of what the I suppose the the the, the conventional manufacturing type industries, so, you know, the car manufacturers and the, uh, uh, the consumer electronics, this just-in-time manufacture. If you know more about your system, then you can actually control to to deliver on time. It's it's not obviously not there yet, and you will always have the vagaries uh, of of the weather systems and inputs, but um, uh, it can be certainly become a lot more resilient this way. So so starting on some examples, I'll, I'll talk around three technology platforms. And um, what, when we talk about technology platforms on, uh, in, in the sort of engineering world, it, it, it's very, very careful. We, we apply the term platform because it's not a product. A platform can actually deliver lots of different types of products. Uh, and so I'll give examples of how these are evolving into specific products. But um, I'll, I'll talk around three platforms. One looking above a crop canopy, uh, one looking below the soil, uh, and one actually looking outside of the crop itself. Um, and so, yes, as a, with, um, a few years ago with Lutz Plummer uh, over at University of Bonn, and he, uh, he, he turned this firm, he said, uh, what, 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 what's the, the, the phrase I want to use for you? You're cheap and cheerful. Um, yeah, okay, fine, thanks Lutz. Um, and so it's, uh, it, it's coming from that viewpoint about, you know, well, how do you get something right down in cost? um by doing it in a different way taking a very much black box approach in it so with the above crop imaging we've we've started with um hyperspectral imaging and uh, a variant of hyperspectral imaging which is now referred to as multispectral and effectively it's just reduced wave bands for, for hyperspectral imaging so so if if for any reason people aren't aware of hyperspectral imaging it's basically what you've got you've got an image and every element of that image, every pixel in that image um, has got a full spectrum behind it. Um, so if, if you're looking at, say, just, just the classic visible light, 400 to 700 nanometers wavelengths, um, there's a full spectrum there. Our eyes obviously can only ever see a composite of red, green, and blue. Um, but there's a lot more information behind that. And so, of course, once you start going outside of just the straight visible, then you start picking up even more information. Now, admittedly, of course, with, with, with crops, because they do uh, respond to light, a lot of the information is still in the, in the visible bit, which is actually very useful, uh, especially when it comes from the engineering perspective, uh, because with um, visible light, um, of course, there's been so much work done on silicon-based detectors, very low-cost silicon-based detectors, making digital cameras. So, so we worked with initially with the University of Bonn uh, under their, their, I think it was called PropSense at the time, their, their, their partnership. Uh, it's back in the early sort of 2010, 11 sort of time. And they're, they're actually the first group we'd seen that um, had uh, taken a classic, um, see if your mouse works, I'm not sure the, uh, if the pointer works when you, when you put it on a slide like this, but um, um, they took sort of classic imaging. I'll say it, Bruce, by the way. All oh, right, okay, good. <laughs> Cheers, Rob. Um, so they took their sort of classic um, cameras that you would have sat up on a satellite or up in, a, um, in an aircraft flying over on high uh, and whacked it down close to the, the crop. So basically, um, they put it in a dark room. So we've got a, basically a, um, a, a visible um, multispectral imager here and a near infrared one on, on the side. So it's going slightly outside the visible. Um, and they put it in a dark room, put it about uh, a meter or so above the uh, the plants, and they then put um, 600 watts of halogen lamps in there to um, to basically uh, act to what the sun's doing. You know, basically to give a spectrum of light which was controlled. Um, and the reason use 600 watts, these six uh, at the side here, is because they the, if they if they start taking their images any more than that. Um, or they took the images for more than about 30 seconds, it basically desiccated the plants. So it's a much energy they could get, uh, get in the system. So we looked at that and, they, uh, and we said, okay, because you're going close to the crop now, um, 
and you don't have sunlight anymore, why not turn the problem upside down? And so people had done this before, but where we've been going, we're saying, okay, well, how do you actually drop the cost? Doing my usual sort of thing. So, so we basically turned up and the, um, this imaging thing they've got here, I think at the time it was about 150,000 euros for the, uh, uh, for one of each of these cameras. Uh, I don't know what halogens cost, but you know, it's a, it's, it's a reasonable cost. So we turned up um, with, I think this is a Canon digital camera that's in the middle here. Um, and digital cameras, they are nascent multi-spectral images. Um, they, they have a, an infrared filter that's built into them because when, um, when Canon and, uh, and these sorts of people make their cameras, they don't want to see into the infrared um, they, because it blurs the photos. Uh, and so if you rip that infrared filter out, silicon is actually capable of operating from around about 1100 nanometers in the longer wavelengths through to roughly about 380 nanometers. And the reason it stops at 380 nanometers is because that is where all the camera manufacturers think, well, nobody wants to see below 380 nanometers with, with a visible camera. So we'll just put our sensitive transistors down that depth underneath so they don't get damaged. So, so basically, you, if you look at that, visible light is 400 to 700 nanometers. You've then got another spectrum again, which is free for you. You know, it comes with the camera. So we, so we turn up with uh, one of these modified cameras, just ripped its filters out, um, and a thousand LEDs. Um, so basically, we had a, a research associate spend a very therapeutic afternoon or two soldering a thousand LEDs onto a board. Um, and in there, we selected out um, the same five wave bands, which the guys at Bonn had used as a very nice, um, uh, basically, they, they created a model around uh, how they would detect various diseases. And one of their model diseases was um, Circospora in the um, cosphora in um, sugar beet. So they had this very nice model that, uh, that showed that you could see the way that spores developed across the leaf before you would see them visually. And it was based on these wave bands. So we thought, okay, well, let's whack those wave bands in. Let's, um, let's try and see if we can do the same. Yeah, with our, I think it was about 200, uh, a 200 pound camera and about 50 quid's worth of LEDs or whatever it was at the time, but maybe about 100 quid by the time I finished. Um, and we got imaging that was not just equivalent to what they were getting with their, you know, 300,000 euros worth of camera unit with our couple hundred quid's worth, but it was actually better. Um, and the reason was because um, we could put down a lot of energy at the wave bands. You know, we could actually have LEDs uh, putting out almost as much energy in a narrow band as what the halogen lamps, these broadband halogen lamps that um, work across all these various different wavelengths were doing because we wouldn't fry the plant. Um, and so we could put a lot of um, energy down at the wave bands that were required. And also uh, our detector, because it's a, a classic consumer electronics type of detector, I think at the time, um, the digital cameras, you know, the, the, the SLR digital cameras, about 12 megapixels, you probably get on your phone now. Um, and so we were getting higher resolution images with better, what we call signal to noise uh, in the engineering world. Uh, and so we, we got these really nice images and um, from you know, a couple of quid for the camera. But that's, that's all right. And then you start thinking, well, if you're going to do that, if you're going to start um, working close up to a crop, what else can you do with a bunch of LEDs and a camera? Uh, and so we started working with the Bristol Robotics guys. Um, and they're, they've been doing machine vision for years. And one of the, um, the approaches um, Mel Smith and his team were doing down there um, was a thing called photometric stereo. Now, what this does, for, for our multi-spectral imaging, we want beautifully even light. And we spend a lot of time trying to get a very nice homogeneous light. Um, the guys that do um, photometric stereo, they stuff the whole thing and actually create light that's in point sources, but they're the same sources of light. They just don't make them uh, diffuse. They make them um, point sources. And if you do that, what, what happens is, if you imagine if you're sitting in a, um, I don't know, normally a room with, again, it's not really easy to do this on an online thing, but if you sat in a normal sort of conference room where it's got spotlights coming down from the, uh, from the ceiling, 
you'll see shadowing around anything, anything that's sitting up uh, vertically. Um, and so if you use that technique and you basically you imagine you've turned on and off the various spotlights in a room, you'll see different shadows forming, you know, they, they, they go around in different directions. And that's effectively what you do with photometric stereo. You can get a three-dimensional structure, information on three-dimensional structure from one camera. You don't need a stereo camera. Now, for us, that's interesting because the camera is your expensive bit. Um, the light sources tend to be very cheap. So you have a lot of those, you drive in a certain ways, and you can get three-dimensional imaging in multispectral ways with, um, with, with a single camera and a few, a few LEDs. So you've got cheap hardware, and it's the software that's the, the bit that's doing all the clever stuff. And that then um, takes you on to well, what else can you do? Oops, with um, And if you start um, controlling the light around a plant, of course, plants respond to light. I mean, the fluorescence uh, work that's been done for, for years now, you know, actually um, looking at shutting down the various um, PS2 mechanisms and, and looking at what happens in PS1 underneath. Um, that's, that's all obviously well-established work. But um, where we're also working with um, Steve Ross team over in Sheffield, hence you know, talking around all the partnering stuff, that's just keeping an eye on the town actually, um, is, um, is working on how we subtly manipulate the actinic light, the fluorescent light, around a plant, because you can do it the same type of instrument. Uh, you've got these LEDs and the camera. You're not making any different hardware. You're not adding anything to the cost or minimally to the cost. Um, but you can actually start manipulating things. And I'll, I'll come on a bit more with that later, but I'll give, a, give an example anyway. We, we, the first thing we did uh, with our buddies over in Syngenta and with G's, uh, G's Fresh down in, uh, uh, in East Anglia was go for a big variant. So. We did the hyperweeding project in about the mid 2000s. This gives you an idea about what you can do with sensors when you stuff them in the field. Um, and this is um, on the back of our, our John Deere here. Um, we've got um, this thing. So this is a self-leveling platform. I think it's actually designed originally, uh, this, this actual platform. Again, cherry picking literally from, from lots of things. Um, it's a carrot topper, I think this, this thing was originally. Uh, so it's, it's designed to be auto auto leveling, even though there's not many hills in uh, in East Anglia. Um, and we bung this thing underneath. And what's under there is basically one of our multi spectral images. Um, it's quite a cut down variant of it. Now, what it looks at is uh, it's just a few wave, wave bands picking up um, weeds amongst the lettuce crop. And the idea here is that um, with all the issues around, of course, um, tolerance being generated to herbicides. Uh, and obviously the environmental issues about over usage of, of, of herbicides. Um, we were saying, okay, well, can you actually start uh, turning it the other way around and putting a robotic system on the back of these things, identify where your early emergent um, weeds are, and just target those with non-selective herbicides. Uh, in particular, we're looking at glyphosate in this unit, but um, uh, the, you know, any non-selective could in theory be operated in, in, in this sort of approach. So, so here we have our, our two big variants of our LEDs uh, with a, um, a, what we call an integrating sphere, which is, a, well, in, integrating hemisphere. So this gives a nice homogeneous lighting in this big black box at the bottom here. And in the back here, there's a set of little point sprayers. And so um, I think, yeah, it's this one. It's a very, very short video just showing the thing, picking through the field at sort of the, the speed that we were running when we were doing the, uh, uh, the early work. And you'll see at the back of it, these little things. So these are driven by the uh, by the, the multi-spectral imager in the box at the front there. So our task then is actually try and make this thing go a bit faster. So here we have our, our tractor going through a 10 kilometers per hour, which you know I suppose you suppose 10 kilometers per hour. So it's just, that's, it's a fast walking pace. It would be a, a jogging pace effectively. Um, so okay, the video sort of runs showing the, the tractor going through there. This one down here is the web camera underneath looking through our lettuce field. And you can see as it's um, static, you've got these little weeds that are just, uh, you can see on the, on the, the webcam, they're just around there. Uh, and on the, um, the image detection, the image um, processing we've got here, and it, um, what we had was basically little white dots, it was where it's detecting the weeds and it sprays them. Um, the yellow bit formed around the, uh, the crop itself is what we've had as an exclusion zone 
basically just to uh, because the sprayers would never actually be as accurate because of the wind and the, the flow of the uh, the motion or rest of it to guarantee that you you, you you know if you're within fractions of a millimeter you might identify the uh, the weed there but you really don't want to be killing your crop with an with a, a, an unselected herbicide so we'd have this exclusion zone around there to keep uh, Mr G's fresh happy um, and so if you start the tractor going and we start the webcam going we start the the imaging going um, so as you start the tractor and then the webcam starts looking down here and you suddenly you know you've got this washing machine now that you can you can hardly see anything spinning around in there um, but the the image processing ticks away very happily under there. Um, so, so this is sort of showing this, that, you know, we could do this stuff at speed in a field. Um, and then the other end of the engineering for, for the actual production stuff was, well, it's all very well to do that, to stop all these things. Um, but um, you can't spray at that speed. So we then started working with Syngenta on uh, a, a very old technique. Um, I think ICI did it originally, so you know, precursor to Syngenta uh, through Zeneca days and stuff, and that's the Electrodyne. But the problem with the Electrodyne, uh, and if people are unfamiliar with this, it's, um, it's a really nice technique in theory. Um, you, uh, you basically put static charge on a, on, a, um, on a droplet, and that will then grab onto anything because it's, it's charged, um, it's, it's got a positive charge on it it will grab onto anything that's earthed and plants happen to be earthed because you know the roots are, are bolted into the ground and so the the theory is that the um the droplets will then form around the plant you can actually go on the underside of the leaf as much as on the top and you, you have a very small amount of spray um only problem was that when they did this back in the sort of early what, mid 70s into the 80s i think they were starting to do this stuff it would also target anything it would basically spray your tra your tractor as well because it's also earthed um, and so, and it also only ever worked with um, uh, basically non aqueous systems. So, we've been working with Syngenta on um, how we can make a system like that operate at high speed um, with um, aqueous systems and, um, and uh, just target around the weeds themselves. So, so that's sort of where we go with sort of one aspect of the multi spectral imaging. Uh, but we started seeing lots of duties for it in three dimensions, uh, looking at especially robotic based, looking at um, early fungal bacterial infections in production scale. So we spun out a company called Fatenix, uh, which I'm not actually involved with anymore, uh, Rob. I, uh, I was an initiator of it, but I stood back because there's a conflict of interest. So it's actually an ex um, PhD student of mine who's now, who's now CEO of it. And they did a nice job actually working on uh, getting this stuff out there. And I think they're onto their. Um, second level VC round or something. So, you know, you can actually make a bit of cash out of this stuff. But on the other hand, you don't have to make cash. So uh, we've worked with the Gates Foundation uh, quite a bit, and, uh, and in particular in Cassava in, um, in East Africa. And, you know, went out there, and, and this is actually, uh, I think it's John Colvin's hands in there. There's John Colvin at the bottom there from Greenwich University. Uh, has worked out in that area for, for many, many years and looking at the, he's a virologist. And, it, you know, I thought, well, appliance of science, they all got out of the, uh, out of the, um, out of the Land Rover as a driver to the field. And they got out these uh, basically petrol tube and a petrol filter and started sucking white flies off the base of leaves. And that's the way that we're actually detecting uh, the spread of the, uh, of, of, of the vector for a particular disease in cassava. And for, again, cassava, it's, um, it's, probably the primary source of carbohydrates, in, certainly in East Africa, in Tanzania, Kenya, and uh, Uganda, and places like that. Um, but it, and it's also very good in, in poor soils, but it does suffer from, in particular, from two viruses, uh, from mosaic virus and from brown street virus. And mosaic virus, oh, well, they're both by the sounds of the names, you know, they, uh, they look like that in the leaves at the late stage disease. Mosaic is actually quite, tends to be fairly easy to, to see visually. Brown streak isn't. So we've worked on a, deploying these uh, multi spectral approaches at a, a lot lower cost alongside colleagues in um, NC State University um, with the IITA, the in, International Institute for Tropical Agriculture in Tanzania. Um, and we've got a recent paper out in, um, I think it's, it's, it's in Nature. Uh, scientific reports about making this stuff work at low cost uh, and we're now actually going to the next step of actually you know get, getting the thing from the laboratory into the into the field 
uh, and it's, it's been great fun standing in fields with, with bits of, uh, of analyzers and stuff. One of the other things I touched on earlier was around the fluorescence imaging. And um, what, what we're starting to do now is actually, it's like Dr. Doolittle, it's actually in talking to plants. Because of course, in the chloroplasts, um, the surface of the chloroplasts, we've got a lot of mechanisms going on in the photosynthetic systems. So working in particular with the, the guys over in Sheffield uh, from the plant science other things, you know, they, they, they know a lot about how, uh, how all these various mechanisms work in terms of the, the photosystems in the, uh, in the leaf and, um, and how these various electron pumps and bits and pieces and then it's uh, cycling off into, uh, into the Calvin cycle underneath. But as an engineer, um, I look at that and I think, well, okay, great. You've got a, um, a multi-stage system which is driven by two light sources coming in here, two light detectors which actually drive your system. There's lots of, of um, kinetics going on in there, lots of things being, you know, um, systems sort of filling up, in this case, the, the electron pool filling up between the, uh, and, and emptying between the, um, these two photosystems, and then all the, uh, the various um, sort of transfers through the, the membrane of the, um, of the chloroplasts. And they've all got their own delays, and then we've got the, the shift into the Calvin cycle, which of course, um, with the carbohydrate, the carbon sorry, the carbohydrate um, storing and the carbon fixation that happens there. It's a multi-stage process again, all with kinetics, which gets affected by the any diseases the plant might have, any secondary metabolites it might produce. Of course, actually, uh, then affect that system as well. So. If you take these multi-spectral imaging systems, these active systems we've had with a few LEDs and a camera, and you start playing around with signals into it, um, and you start just putting a periodic modulation onto the light. This has been known for, for quite a few years, about 20 odd years, there's been a guy um, over in Ulick, Nedball, has been pushing this uh, for quite a few, Ladislav Nedball, um, but very much from a, a lab base, and we're coming up saying, well, how do you actually get this thing out into a real field type unit for, for doing imaging? So behind every pixel, we're finding this type of data. So uh, what you're seeing there is driving the, um, the photosystems with a different frequencies, different periodic frequencies or different, well, in this case, it's frequency, but the intensity um, affects it as well. So if you drive it, drive your photosystem with a, a a, a periodic uh, signal at different intensities and different uh, frequencies, you can start getting the plant to start telling you things uh, because you're then starting to probe down into the various reaction kinetics. If you go very, very slowly, it's like the plants watching the, the, the uh, clouds go across the, um, the sun or something, or, uh, you know, it can respond to that. As you go faster and faster, it can't catch up. But there's a bit in between, it's the interesting bit, where it sort of catches up, but doesn't. Some of the mechanisms follow, some don't. So you then start probing into what, what that is actually telling you about the plant. And because this is happening behind every single pixel, you get spatial information across the, uh, the leaf as well, about how the, um, the chloroplasts are being affected by uh, basically any, any um, interaction with the leaf structure. So it's the wild west at the present moment, but we're actually developing the capability to do this. So we started from very sort of clunky units. This is us out in the NC State. In fact, that's uh, Mary Beth and at NC State with the cassava leaf, with these clunky sort of thing looks like a torch. Um, we then tried to go to a, a, a vaguely handheld thing with a sort of thing, the umbilical bit that goes on around the leaf, um, and it's a bit clunky. Um, so we're now moving to a proper handheld unit and. Um, and some sort of flexible front end on it that we're still developing. But the next bit is also to then make IoT type devices. And, and that's where we are working with people like Sony to say, well, how can you do this in, um, with, with real mass production uh, and get these things out at you know, a few dollars a piece or so. So, so okay, so that's, that's sort of the above the crop canopy. And you, know, you see where we're sort of going here, you'll get good old Spock in his, uh, his tricorder. Um, you know, you're basically trying to create something that can see lots and lots of different things. Uh, you put a few bits together, GPS camera, microprocessors, some satellite, satellite manipulation, and you can see lots of different features. Um, and so, you know, so, so, so these sort of things we talk about so far, but you, you then say, well, okay, well, plants, um, I'm get, get off this. So plants, obviously, they're like icebergs, you know, they, 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 they're only expressing um, a part of what happens 
in the foliage bit above the crop. It's the bit below the crop, which is the uh, it is a lot more as equally as interesting, if not more interesting, especially I think uh, with all the tuber production, of course, at the APGC. Um, and so this is why we get this this uh, I always refer to the thing about common language. And uh, so I'm going over over a bit. Uh, Rob, how how long if if, if <laughs> I didn't know. Yeah, you, you, you've got another. You're happy to speak for another twenty minutes if you like. Yeah, okay. Well, I'll, 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 you've got plenty of time. Right, I'll, I'll try and uh, sort of. Uh, everybody with stuff but look at this this thing is it's it's actually quite a telling image this so this is looking below the uh below the ground with a, an approach i'll just come into in a second but um um this is also if you talk to an engineer and you talk to about a plant they'll think it's a big steel thing that makes chemicals um so there is a common language thing here but you know <laughs> this is a plant that's a green thing and it's a big steel thing so this the next bit i'm going to talk about is actually we started in the chemical plants and it's actually used for um, process imaging within things like this. This is a, this is a four meter diameter uh, filtration system. It's a pressure filtration system. So basically, um, clears a, it clears out the solid product from a, a slurry. It's actually an insecticide that's produced in this one. Um, so you can basically walk around this thing. We put electrodes in the base of it, and um, so. You can't image into solid opaque materials in, in a process plant, but in the same way, you can't image visually into, into soils. But what we would do with the, the chemical plant is you would image the way that uh, electrical signals were affected by the, um, the, the aqueous liquor that was in the slurry. And as, the, as it dried out, that would change its conductivity and its capacitance, uh, its electrical conductivity and, and capacitance in a, in a non-homogeneous way. And so the, the approach that we were using for monitoring a slurry in a chemical plant, we thought, well, okay, well, soil, it's basically a solid uh, a trickle bed filter. I mean, it's a very complex variant of it, but in the end, moisture, flows through it and solvents flow through it in a complex interaction with the particulates. So can you use the same sort of approaches? And so the, the way you do it is basically you have a set of electrodes and you mount them up, you know, here. It's shown the classic ways on the periphery of a, of a pipe or something, or, or in this case, it would be a, um, a plant pot. Um, but they don't have to be on the periphery. They can be in a planar structure. It can be wherever you like them. But what you do is in the middle here, you assume that um, if, if it's homogeneous, what happens is if you drive an electrical current between two of the electrodes, you get what they call in the uh, electronics world, equipotential lines. Basically, it's, it points virtual sort of lines you could draw through in, in, into a structure where the voltages remain the same. So they, they sort of go as a corona out from your current source. You know, you've got high voltages here and then the corona out. Um, if you detect the voltages at the periphery, you can then reconstruct an image of what happen, happens in the middle. Um, it's, it's not, it's, it's what they call a soft field tomography. Um, so it's not like x-ray imaging where you get these beautiful images of, I mean, the guys at Nottingham, who we work with a lot with um, hairs of roots you can see in soil structures and these things. Now what we get is globology. We get basically an idea about how the, the nutrients are moving around in soil structure around the, the root bundle. Uh, but that can be done live, you know, you, you and you can do it cheaply. It's basically console and some voltmeters. Um, so that's what we started doing. We're saying, can we actually get this stuff out into uh, mass sort of production for looking into crops? And we did uh, some work with Ivers, um, also Nottingham and Ollie Sheffield again, um, on club root infection in brassicas. And so, you know, club root, um, you know, forms these gall in the, in the root bundle. Uh, but you don't see it above the crop until um, way down the line. And so classically, if you're trying to breed for tolerance, you'll be doing shovel omics. You'll be digging the stuff out, seeing what happens at the end. So we said, okay, can we actually see the gall start to form with um, electrical impedance imaging? Uh, and you get, yeah, you get some uh, some good results out of that. So, and we've got a paper in Plant Methods, I think, describing that. And so uh, this is a big clunky beast, but it's got a, a, a effectively an IoT type device in this box here. 
Uh, and we started deploying these things for, for looking at what happens in, uh, in, in root bundles. And we then uh, reference it against um, the, the work at, uh, in the Hounsfield unit with the, with the Nottingham guys. So we basically produce, we don't try and do X-ray imaging. Uh, it's not in, that, that, that's not the idea, but X-ray images are expensive beasts and you don't tend to drag them through fields. So I think UC Davis did actually put them through a field once and broke it very rapidly. Um, and so we're saying, okay, well, use your, your sort of um, AIT to give you proxy measures, which you can actually deploy in the field. And um, our colleagues from, uh, from Nigeria here were particularly interested in cowpea production and how you get phosphate tolerance um, being bred into it. So we work again alongside the gates and a bit of, um, well, we used to have a GCRF funding, Global Challenges funding, um, to start developing these approaches for phosphate stressing. We're still doing that work. So, um, so you sort of see where we're get, oops, go, going here. Because, uh, you know, if, um, if you've got your multispectral system sitting on the top here, and you're also, at the same time, looking at the, at the bottom, looking at the, um, what's happening inside the root bundle, then you've got synchronous information. Instead of having your, um, your expensive um, uh, PSI system sat in, or, or um, Lemnitec system sat in Ibers or something in Aberystwyth, and your, 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 um, uh, your X-ray imager in the house field in Nottingham, um, you can bring them all together if you're doing low cost, and you actually get synchronous measurements. And so, oh, I'll get them from the, the CGI, it's a, Going, going through the, all the various bits and pieces. But, you know, you can actually start pulling out more information, of course, because you're doing above and below ground at the same time. So you see the effect of what's happening below the, the water line with the, the iceberg is what's happening on the top. You know, so you see when the, the iceberg's melting because you're not, not just looking at the top, you're looking at the underneath. Um, and of course, you can then start manipulating the system. So we've taken a bit of a punt on this. We start making a, a, a small variant of this and it's, um, and basically took over one of the cubicles and new research glass house that they, uh, they built during COVID actually with um, uh, over at South Manchester. And so we've taken it over the robotic unit and we, we started, uh, they've got a multispectral head on the, on the top of this thing on a three axis robotic gantry. Uh, and underneath um, we started putting um, our EIT unit. So this is, you know, sort of a, Fairly clunky, but you know, these things start showing people, you know, what you can actually do with this stuff. And um, working with, um, in particular, Phenome UK, uh, and it's hopefully where we're going with it in the future. I'm sure Rob, maybe we can talk about this at the end of the Q and A. But um, you know, saying, well, just give it a go. Let's just see what we can do if we actually do these measurements at the same time, and we start building other bits and pieces in there as well. As engineers, all we need, we just need people to tell us what you need. You know, so. Moving away from the crop itself, of course, was there's things that happen before um, we get to the crop. And so we took a rather black box approach on, okay, pathogens. There's obviously a reason why a pathogen, um, whether it's fungal, bacterial, viral for that matter, but you know, fungal and bacterial in particular, um, why they will actually grow on a certain crop, but not on another one. Um, they're obviously doing something uh, some sort of detection when they hit the plant leaf that they can actually work out how to actually grow head towards, in this case, it heading towards the weakness in the leaf and towards the stomata um, and invade the plant. You know, what is it doing? Obviously it's detecting things. This thing's got sensors in there. So how do we actually emulate that and actually say, could we create a biometric um, plant? You know, basically an electronic version of a plant um, which isn't a plant, you know, basically it's as susceptible to a, uh, oops, uh, is a, it's more susceptible or as susceptible to a disease as what you've got in the, uh, as the crop itself. You know, the, the classic idea of a, a sentinel crop in a field being a, a more aged one that's more susceptible to a disease coming in. So, um, so here we have our electronic sentinel and it's uh, built into the back of a, a, a modified funnel. There's actually a lot of fluid dynamics that go into that funnel. But if you have one of those, it's fine. It's a, and it, you know, this is what when CGI people get involved, it looks like something of alien hitting this thing. Um, we've got material in there that actually emulates the, uh, the, the plant leaf, makes the spore think that it's actually uh, on its plant. And then we have a detection medium underneath that actually sees that that's happening. It does it in real time. So you get real time information that your disease is coming into the crop. 
fine, that just tells you you've got your disease in the crop. But if you have lots and lots of these, then of course, they all talk to each other. And so if one of them says, I'm suffering a disease, another one says, I'm suffering a disease, and downwind, although the modeling that's, uh, you know, people like Rotham said they're doing and others, um, says that, well, you, you, your spores are likely to be traveling in this direction. You're ground truthing the models all the time. So, um, so from that sort of black box concept, um, again, working with in this, in actually in the developing economy first, it's, uh, and it's sort of come full circle here. Um, we, we had a, a workshop with, uh, in Rwanda, um, again, it's, it's funded by the Gates, and um, it was alongside um, uh, Chris, uh, Chris Gilligan's team over in, um, in, in Cambridge, and they were doing a load of work on modelling of, um, of uh, rust coming into wheat crops, in particular in, Ethi in um, Ethiopia, um, because, and the way they would actually come down through the, um, uh, through basically the, the Rift Valley and the basically super highway for spores coming down from the Middle East, where it's like the, uh, the Wild West with these things re, 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 reforming each year. And the idea was actually to see if we can pick up UG99 early, you know, the, the, a particular variant of, um, of rust, which um, I, I don't think there's any tolerance to it yet. So this is really the paranoia about, you know, is it going to actually hit? And if it does, you've got to actually isolate. And you know, UG99 actually could, could well come into Europe. I think this has been cases in Southern Europe. So, so we said, okay, well, let's start working on this stuff. We, we did this from an early Gates Foundation funded stuff with, with NIAB about, well, let's make some materials that actually, this are yellow rust in this case, and that's a high fay in it, and start uh, creating some mimetic materials. And one of the things that drives them is actually the surface topology and surface texture. So we've actually embedded in, this has actually been uh, uh, embossed into, I think it's basically cling film here, uh, from a, what effectively is a CD, you know, a, a compact disc, you know, with a certain texture embedded onto the surface it, pressed into the cling film, we get this nice structure that uh, emulates a plant leaf if you actually um, engineer the, the, um, uh, the surface chemistries in the right way to have the right waxy structures as well. So fine, that's one part of it, and we have cameras looking at this and all this stuff. Um, but we started seeing other features as well, things like the volatile signatures. And we're working again with John Colvin's team at Rothamsted in how, um, how we actually can manipulate those um, to grow in particular. Our target one is yellow rust at the moment, um, but also looking at mildews in, in horticulture. So yellow rust for, for wheat. So looking at cereals, we're also looking at um, horticulture. And, um, you know, so we just started doing some work out in Ethiopia. That's what happens when you start driving out into Ethiopia and uh, start looking through the field and inoculating plants and bits and pieces. But in, in some ways, it's it, having started in the developing world and saying, well, let's go, go that way. It, the political issues in Ethiopia at the moment sort of arrested the project a bit. So what happened is it all went full circle. We actually started um, working on, uh, working with DEFRA. Uh, and in fact, we just got a, fun, a project, uh, one of the um, R&D projects funded from DEFRA alongside BASF and Sony. Um, to take this forward for European farming um, and work again with G's, and that's why we're looking at downy mildew as well as the, the rust uh, and developing these sensors. And so the, the real thing that's driving this is actually having uh, Sony as one of the partners because they're an imaging company. Um, they make most of the imaging detectors in the world's cameras. So they are very keen on actually what they can do with their technologies that go into the agri world uh, and in the more the um, environmental sustainability world as well, because it's, yeah, we can make money. Um, and so that's, you know, having gone from the develop world, developing world, to, we're now back in the develop developed world. And I hope it does go back around to the developing world when, it, when uh, things stabilize a bit more in Ethiopia. Um, yeah, so I mean, I'll, 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 I'll try and close out now, but just say there's a lot of bits and pieces in there and around how we actually image onto those structures which involve again led arrays and lots of software to basically increase the the magnifying power of optics beyond what a cheap acrylic lens can do from a mobile phone camera and you can do this because in the crop world things don't tend to happen very rapidly so you can use time to um to give you a balance between resolution if you take more images and you take them at uh, with slightly different illuminations, you can actually reconstruct and actually resolve, 
get your resolving power, your, your uh, ability to see very, very micro features in uh, the way that spores are responding to your artificial substrate um, that you couldn't see with the cheap optics. You don't need to have expensive cameras out there uh, and microscopy systems. As long as you're using time, you can get away with it. So it's, it's, it's thinking a different way, really. Um, so this is what I would uh, say, you know, if we're moving into the field, this is what I would, uh, if, I, if I do a talk with people like Simon Lincoln over at, uh, Simon Pearson over at Lincoln, uh, what we do is the eyes and ears, and, and that's really where I'm, I'm sitting. But of course, there is the, the other end of things, the, uh, the arms and legs, where you want to be really going into the fully autonom autonomous systems, whether you're doing production or whether you're doing phenotyping. And I think I'll, uh, I'll shut up there, because I think I did actually, yeah, oh, oh, three minutes short of the hour. So, um, yeah, <laughs> so I'll stop things there, Rob. <laughs> Well, thank you, Bruce. That was a fascinating and, and very wide ranging talk. <clears throat> and I have to say, I really enjoyed your analogy, analogy about building bombs. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'll open the floor to questions. If anyone has a question, please feel free to a mic or um, tap it into the uh, into the chat box and I'll ask on your behalf. OK, <laughs> well, while we're waiting, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, carry on. Yeah, so while we're waiting, I mean, so I noticed you didn't really talk about this very much, but I noticed on one of your slides, you were showing how hyperspectral imaging is, is affected by um, lighting angle. Mm. And, yes. and, and I wondered if you could just comment on that a bit more and, and what features are causing those changes. Yeah, again, this is something that um, the guys at Bond. Uh, so first, uh, I mean, they're probably not the first people to ever have done this, but they, the first one that alerted us to it, um, as you orientate a leaf, uh, of course, um, uh, ooh, I, won't, I won't go back to the slides, but they, um, the, the way that the light penetrates into the leaf will change. You know, you're changing your, your angle into it. Uh, and so all these subtle spectral features that you're trying to see then they all change as the leaf topology moves. You know, if you have, um, I mean, this classic one that people go on about, oh, well, stick an, an image on a drone and you'll be, you'll be fine, you know. No, you won't, because every time your leaf moves, and they, they did a really nice study. In fact, if you look um, at, the, I think probably it's Lutz Plummer you want, you want to look up, but they um, did a paper uh, for, uh, from Bonn that shows if you change the orientation of the leaf, you get massive changes in the multispectral signatures generated. Um, so the classic way of doing things is that um, you you basically stick your leaf down and you flatten it. You put it under a graticule or something. So you, so, so you are looking at planar structure. And so where we've come from, say, well, you put that three-dimensional bit in there, as long as you know that the, um, the way the texture changes, you can then actually then compensate for those... Um, for, for the orientation. So that, that's, that's where we're coming from with that. Okay, thank you. So we've got a question from uh, Carl Otto, one of our previous speakers, I believe. <laughs> I was just wondering, the, the challenge of high specs, um, you have these wave, wavelengths and the penetration of different colors are different in different wavelengths. So the red would be more on the surface, the blue would deep, penetrate deeper. So when you tilt the leaf, you, you actually get a lot of simple physical changes yeah. that, that give you different results. So yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. But at least if you know what angle you're at, you know that that's happening. Uh, but you, yeah, you're right. Of course, um, you know, the fact that the blue light is now not going through at the same angle, then that's going to cause massive differences. You know, this is why I have this real hang up with people that say they can just uh, put multispectral imager in a drone and then uh, get, you know, see where your black grass sits in your, in your, in your you weak crop now. <laughs> a lot of people have been working. When I play with our hyperspectral uh, units, then you can get 62 different uh, ratios out. So it really depends on how you tilt and how you measure and how the ratios are developing. And I can't explain what's going on sometimes. Yeah. I can read it. But... Yeah, no, the, the, yeah, in some ways you can be pragmatic and say, well, okay, we know that's happening. So as long as you know the angle and you know when it goes in a certain way, but yeah, what it's actually telling you is that it's, yeah, that's, that's another story. But I have another question. Um, 
just to move to another field. Have you been looking at, at uh, quality of kernels or beans of, of kernels or seeds uh, non invasively? Because that could be one of the fun things. Yeah, I mean, uh, personally, I haven't, no, but I mean, um, what, what sort of angles are you thinking about? Well, I, what I'm playing, I'm playing with lupins right now. Mm. Uh, we see differences in uh, composition of proteins depending on which kind of stress we apply on the plants, which is a bit yeah. tricky because we would like to know what happens and depending on, on the stress, not waiting to the to be able to uh, to harvest them and analyze them. Mm. Yeah, I mean, it, it's nothing I've looked at so far, but I mean, here, as I try to say at the start, you know, there's a bunch of engineers, we just need to get told what the problems are. Um, so as, 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 when people start saying that, okay, start saying, well, okay, well, um, what is it you're trying to see in these sorts of things? Oh, okay, that'd be interesting one to have a look at. I'll come back. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Um, so, Ken, you've typed something in the box. Do you just want to unmic and, and ask a question or? Yep, I can do. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Thanks. Um, yeah, no, it's just a bit about what you were talking about with looking at below ground traits of roots within soil and things like that. Um, I was just wondering where you were with that. So is this more controlled environment? Is this within soils or is this within substrates? And are you looking at where you can apply this to a field? Because I know there's been a lot of work looking at, for example, root mass size using um, electrical impedance, which has never really been particularly um, accurate, uh, but I was just wondering, yeah, where you were with your progress. At the moment, it's very much sits in the, the breeding end of things, because you can actually have a very controlled environment. You know, you can uh, have your soils beautifully sieved and repeatable and that sort of stuff. Um, going into the actual field environment is the Wild West again, um, because you've got so many other things happening there. So we've shied away from that so far. Um, just because I think, you know, if we can get some good results out of it in the, the very controlled environment, then you might start thinking about moving to the field. You've got the other problem, of course, with um, the, the field environment. If you are starting to put electrodes in the system, um, then unless you have a no-till system, then you're going to dig the things out of the ground. So things like the, there's been a lot of work done more recently on ground penetrating radar uh, for, the, for the field units, but it's so, so, so to answer your question, no, well, we've not gone into the field as yet with that. Um, let, let's see what we can get in the, in the breeding uh, environment first. No, because there's just, um, yeah, there's obviously been a lot of growth in the area of um, field monitoring, um, as in outdoors in soil. Um, one area I'm starting to get quite an interest in is thermal conductivity of soils, which I'm guessing from an electrical engineer approach, will probably is not that difficult a parameter to measure and this relates to tillage type system and plant establishment um so yeah no it's um it was interesting hearing your different approach to things yeah well when you say it's not that difficult to measure it's a it depends <laughs> on how long a piece of string because um it, a lot of them operate on an ac based system so that, that you know because they're actually uh they don't want to form like a battery in the um in the soil and, and what happens then is you get the thing called the double air capacitor forming on the surface of the electrode, which um, is, is it's subtle. It's very subtle what happens there. So it's it's not a trivial task actually doing even electrical conductivity. Sorry, no, I meant thermal conductivity, not electrical oh, conductivity. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. Uh, um, that relates to yeah. So um, the speed of which so. It's, Changing the way you manage your soil can change the ability of the soil to heat up. Uh, one of the issues is around kind of uniform germination within no-till systems. Um, and it's going to say about how you can manage the soil to actually, yeah, um, yeah make it uh, basically for optimizing planting so you can get the best establishment. Yeah, I mean, the things like that, we, we, you know, being able to combine those modes of measurement um, is something, you know, we, especially when you've got something you can actually use in the field and say, okay, we well, might, might do a minor deployment, say, in a, a controlled environment of, of other techniques. Um, if you understand how they interact together, then you can actually start moving um, back into the field again. So, so yeah, I mean, the, the thermal connectivity bit, and, and it, to be honest, it's probably something we should actually start integrating into the electrical part um, because they'll give complementary information, I'm sure. 
Yeah, no, it'd be interesting to um, yeah talk maybe about this going forward as we start looking at things. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Any more questions from the floor? Yeah, oh, Rob, I've put one in the chat. Oh, sorry, I missed it. Go ahead, Alison. Um, yeah, so I realise that this is very pathosystem dependent, but I'm interested in um, the efficiency of the spore capture because one of the limitations is usually the ability to get spores at very low numbers into the cyst, into the funnel, and onto the plate. Um, and I'm just wondering if you can elaborate on that a bit yeah. more, and whether it's sensitive enough to allow management intervention. So I know for downy mildew, for example, you'd have a seven to 10 day window before the disease occurred. So there is time there, but um, for other pathogens, they're reliant on detecting very low numbers of spores mm. very early. Yeah, it's a, that's part of the reason why that, the, that sort of weird funnel shape was designed. We, we, we get about 10 to 1, if you're lucky, 15 to 1 concentration ratio generated just purely on that shape. Uh, it's basically using um, aeronautical engineering type techniques. So basically the fluid dynamics that they use in the aero engine, um, applying the same sort of things to the, to the sampler. The way, you know, we, 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 when we looked at, um, at the rust, uh, again, dealing with the Chris Gillespie's team, I think um, the way it worked out, I can't, was it something like it was um, 10 to the 8 to 10 to the uh, 10 spores per unit hectare could actually fall in a field typically, uh, and in the case of rust. And so if you work that one out, that means if you have a one square centimetre um, uh, material that you are actually trying to sense on, then 10 to the 8 equates to, uh, or 10 to the 10, I think, would equate to something like 100 spores per uh, a one centimetre area. Uh, fine, but if it's 10 to the 8, that's 1, you know, so you do need to concentrate up. So that's, yeah, you, you're right that there needs to be um, some sort of concentration done on the spores. Um, but if you've got a lot of spore events, only needs one to actually uh, trigger the system. Um, what we tend to do then is say, okay, one, you, what you don't want is false positives. So you might say, okay, well, it could trigger on just one. This is that one on the square centimeter with no concentrator. Um, but you wouldn't do that. You would probably wait for um, at least um, yeah, an order of magnitude or a couple of orders of magnitude additional um, events occurring. So, so yeah, <laughs> it's talking around the subject, say, even in a passive approach where you don't have a big fan on the back of things like a Burkhard sampler and a car battery, you can actually use the wind to concentrate those those spores. Thanks. Does that answer your question, Alison? It does, yeah. I mean, I'm quite interested in this, so maybe we um, could have a, another conversation yeah. another time. So. Well, well, this is the thing with the um, online uh, uh, Seminars are all great things, but they don't give you a chance to have the chat over coffee, do they? <laughs> <laughs> Quite the same way. What I can do, Bruce, I'll put you and Alison in touch and then we can follow and then you can follow us up. Okay. So do we have uh, anything else from the floor? Okay, if, that, if not, then I'd like to thank Bruce for a, a fascinating seminar. And uh, I think we have another seminar in two weeks time, Donna. Yeah, put the details into the chat. Okay. Um, okay. Details are in the chat box. And this and other APG seminars can be um, seen at the APG website. We have recordings of them. So thanks very much, Bruce. Okay. Cheers, Rob. Catch up later. Uh, did you want to stay and, and chat, Bruce? Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe five minutes. Right. We're just touching base. Yeah. No, it's really, I mean, how much you kept in touch by, um, by Tony in terms of what's happening with the, uh, proposal? So, what I understand, so my understanding, right, is that there's a writing team now, which is, um, you, Steve, Tracy, Sotos, is it? Yeah, Sotos uh, and Darren's on there as well. Darren, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and so, I mean, you know, he's, he's done a pretty good job of keeping people up to date. Um, yeah, so, he, so he's been keeping in touch then, because I mean, it basically, it's, there's nothing hidden. It's just basically we, we, we're doing what we said at the workshop. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, 
you know, the three streams and stuff. So, and then, um, yeah, and Claire's asked for, you know, letters of support and all of that. So we've put one <laughs> in the hub. Yeah. Um, so, so, yeah so, I mean, you know, so, yeah, I mean, we're, you know, I mean, as I said, we haven't got anything to offer at the moment, really. So we just want to support it and stay close to it so that hopefully when the, um, when the big money comes in and we've got yeah. something to offer, you know, then then we, then we can work a lot more closely. Yeah, at the same time, you know, with demonstrating the infrastructure, yeah. for the stuff which was talking about, um, I mean, the, um, the JHI is going to be key to that, you know, because we're, we're going to have to show that, um, yeah, anybody making a request, you know, if, if the JHI has got ability to do something, then it's all part of the network and there's yeah. an easy way in. So, yeah, yeah it's all... All, um, all, all sort of fits in. And I think for us, yeah. as well, you know, it's, it's that train. It's the it's the networking and the training element. You know, I think that's some because we are starting from a very low base, and so you know, it's quite um, important for us, I guess, to find <laughs> extract information from those who are more experienced. Let's put it that way. Yeah, and it's um, it, it uh, it's interesting actually. Uh, I was down in Coventry on Tuesday because the um. The EPSRC are trying to get their census network sorted out. Right. Yeah. And I'm saying, well, yeah, what, what we should be doing, of course, is getting you've got a community of people who are tech providers for the most part, you know, and then, and then tech users. users. Well, yeah. Just get together. You know? <laughs> I was having those conversations. You know, why do you do it like that? Well, you could use use one of these, or why you have thought about using one of these sort of things? You know. And you'd have thought, right, that should be able to do it because it's a UKRI. Funding mm. for the for the CPC uh, CPCI. Well, I, I can always get it wrong, but and they always go on about you know the research councils working across each other. So so will Gom Goma Pets, I think it is that the EPSRC is Rich's equivalent, right? Uh, okay. So yeah, was Rich is in the program for the UK, UK PCPI. Will's doing the one for the census network. So. Um, I, I said to Will, you know, you're going to start talking to Richard. So hopefully something will start happening in the background, but, you know, we we'll keep chipping them along anyway. Okay. Well, look, I mean, you know, I don't want to keep you any longer than necessary, but, you know, if there's anything you need from us, Bruce, then, you know, we're always here. And what I'll do is I'll just send an email connecting you and Alison up. And, um, you know, I think that might be quite, because she's involved in a lot of um, uh, monitoring for Blackleg, I think. Okay. Across the UK. And, you know, we've developed a load of, I mean, so at the moment, we've got um, a set of criteria for potato growers to mm. be um, applying fungicide. It's not black leg, I'm talking rubbish, late light, sorry. Oh, yes. Uh, yeah, okay. uh, <laughs> uh, you know, and, you know, but that's based solely on um, environment, you know, amount of rain and wind and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, so maybe that network of sensors again is something that could be introduced there. But look, I'll put you in touch, and you guys can chat. Yeah, 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 it'd be good. Right, excellent. I'll leave you in peace anyway. Yeah, nice to speak to you, Bruce, and thanks for the thanks for the presentation. Next time we'll have you here. <laughs> yeah, <good>. Bye. <laughs> Bye.